I am Jess. I'm talking today about imposter syndrome in the industry. Um, I wrote this originally as a blog post and gave it that just like stupid title. I didn't really have the foresight to think that I would be giving it as a conference presentation and standing up <laughs> next to a question saying, with the real imposter, uh, please stand up. Um, so yeah, I set myself up for a bit of a fall with that one. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I will just quickly introduce myself before getting on to the talk. Um, I am Dr. Jess. Jessica Barker. I'm not this kind of doctor, but this kind of doctor, which means I can't help when this happens because my work is so much more serious. I work in cybersecurity, but I am not one of these, and I'm not one of these, and I don't often go to work dressed like this, usually just a treat for casual Fridays. Um, <laughs> I am not a technologist by background, um, instead I am a sociologist, so I uh, work with people, think about people, work on the human side of cyber security. I am a consultant. If you ask Google image search what that is, you will find out that I solve puzzles, I create success, and then I solve puzzles, um, and everyone gives me high fives and fist bumps. And that means I get to do fun stuff apart from the day job like this. So speaking at events and you'll see me speaking on TV sometimes, talking about cybersecurity stuff, you will see me looking shocked. <laughs> and <laughs> you will see me looking so hungry. <laughs> you will see me looking very disappointed <laughs> and sometimes really, really sad. <laughs> Um, when I am not doing cybersecurity, as you all know, it creates uh, stress, it's a busy job, so I like to let off steam by doing stuff like this. You all thought I was joking about Casual Friday. Um, stuff like this, uh, stuff like this, uh, which is a new one. And I like making stuff like this, alarm clock, not bomb. Um, <laughs> This uh, kitchen timer and uh, a bit of jewelry as well. And um, I also occasionally steal, steal stuff from people. For example, today I stole this intro from Freaky Clown. Um, <laughs> not the content, obviously. Um, he doesn't look so good holding a gun. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so you're welcome. Um, now to get on with the talk. Um, as I've said, I'm talking about imposter syndrome. I'm going to quickly talk about what imposter syndrome is. I am not an expert in imposter syndrome, um, by which I mean, like, professionally. I'm not an expert. It's not, like, my field of study or um, work or anything. Um, so just a bit of a summary over what imposter syndrome means. Um, it was a term that was coined by Clance and Eames in the late 70s, and it generally sums up like an inability to internalize success. So that feeling of being a fraud, of being kind of waiting to be caught out. Um, so, and it doesn't matter how much success you have, it doesn't matter how many qualifications, certifications, how much experience, um, you constantly feel like it's just luck, or it's just that you're a nice person, it's just that people like you, they take pity on you. Um, so you go through life kind of feeling like you're waiting to be caught for someone to just rock up one day and be like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about, go home. Um, it is, uh, according to the literature, it's, it's kind of deemed a personality trait or part of your personality rather than like a mental disorder. Um, but later on, I will get into a little bit of a discussion about where it maybe crosses over um, into mental health. Traditionally, in the literature, it's seen as something that affects women much more than men. Um, and it was seen like that for decades. And then recently, that's been challenged a bit more. Um, and recent research suggests that it affects men just as much as women. And I sort of wonder if it has a reputation of affecting women more than men, because generally, stereotypically, women talk about their emotions more than men. Women will admit to having feelings more than men. Um, so maybe women have just felt more comfortable speaking up about it um, in the past than men have. Um, 
I'm going to talk about my own little bit of research around it, which is very much connected to this field, which as we know is um, male dominated. So from my understanding, from the research I've done, it certainly affects men um, as much as women. Um, so as I've said, um, I did a little bit of research on this. Um, it was just a Twitter poll, but it ended up being quite popular, had quite a big response. Um, I did it because I was having a few conversations with people um, and they were either saying to me that they felt like this. They were either struggling with the fact um, that they felt like they didn't belong in the industry. They felt like um, they didn't know as much as everyone around them um, and they felt kind of stressed out about it. Or I was talking to people who were recruiting and who were having an issue recruiting people, having an issue convincing people that they were good enough to take the job that was being, you know, discussed with them or, or even offered to them. So uh, I just did a random tweet um, asking people how often they feel imposter syndrome. And as you can see, I got um, over 800 responses. Um, and the biggest response was all the time or, or daily. Um, and just just after that was um, often or weekly. And the lowest response was never. Um, so it seems to me, you know, 64% of people are feeling this on a very regular basis um, in the industry. So I thought it was something worth exploring a little bit more. Um, as well as the responses to the poll, I also got um, a lot of discussion um, coming coming from this tweet, and that for me was was probably the most beneficial part of it. Um, so I'm just going to touch on that now um, before doing a bit of a discussion on what I think the causes are, particularly in relation to this industry, um, and what if you are struggling with it, um, or if you know people who are, what you can do um, to try and um, make it better. So, um, one thing that was particularly noticeable in the responses, loads of people came back um, as well as voting on it to comment and say that they struggled with it. Um, and one thing that was noticeable was that some of those people were very successful in the industry, um, sort of very well known. Um, and, you know, some people even said the more successful they become, the more they struggled with it. Um, ben Hughes, he and I had quite a discussion around it, um, and he went on. Um, about a week or so after the poll to write a really good article about his um, experiences with imposter syndrome. Um, so if it is something that you're interested in, if it is something you're experiencing, I would definitely recommend um, having a look at Ben's article on it. Um, there was a bit of a discussion as to why people feel this way and, and why we think it's particularly prevalent in information security. Um, and for some people, I think this is, this, I can very much relate to this one um, from Chris, where he you know, has a, a background that isn't typical um, in cybersecurity um, and then has gone on to, to working and writing about the field. Um, so that can feel a little bit odd, and I know that I've certainly had that in the past. As I've said, I come from a, a sociological background, um, so you can kind of feel like a bit of a, a fish out of water. Um, also, this feeling of like building people up and then knocking them down, um, which we can tend to do um, quite enthusiastically. Um, the idea we're expected to know about so much stuff, and when you meet a specialist, um, you feel like, well, I don't know as much as that person, um, and start to really question yourself. And Jack Daniel touched on something um, in terms of kind of not being the most human of industries, um, and I'm going to follow up on that in a little while. Um, it manifests itself differently for different people, um, and maybe it, coming coming from experience, some people um, manage it or use it as a way to to push themselves a bit more than others. Um, so the idea that you can use it to stop complacency, to drive you forward. Um, but for some people, it can be a little bit more of a struggle. It can be um, related to um, burnout, to stress, maybe even to depression. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to carry on a little bit of a discussion on that later. Um, I really liked this comment, um, is to realize that everyone else is making up as they go along. Um, and I think sometimes, particularly when you're more junior, you can think like everyone knows everything, everyone's really experienced. Um, and actually, you come to a point where you kind of realize that maybe other people are just like one sheet of the textbook ahead of you. Um, it's not just particular to this industry and if you, you know, as the last, last slide showed, if, you, if you're feeling imposter syndrome, um, then you're in pretty good company. Um, so causes. Um, 
I used the responses that I had from the Twitter poll, some of my own thoughts and experiences, um, to try and explore some of the causes. And it's difficult when you think about the causes of this because they can be reinforcing, so it can be like a bit of a chicken and egg um, situation. Um, looking at the literature and reading around um, imposter syndrome, as I said earlier, there's an argument or a belief that it comes from your personality that is kind of ingrained in, in who you are. Um, that's not to mean you can't challenge and Im improve on it, um, but there is some research that suggests it comes from your family upbringing, um, particularly if you've had a successful um, or, or intelligent um, sibling um, in the family and you've maybe been treated a little bit differently or you've heard lots of praise go on that sibling um, and your upbringing has made you feel like you constantly have to strive to be better. Um, that's just something com coming from the literature. Um, there's also an argument, which I think is a really good point, about the reinforcing nature of it. So if you suffer with imposter syndrome, you feel like you have to work harder and harder. You feel like you um, have to keep learning and developing um, and make sure that you know enough um, to, to not be caught out. And of course, the more you do that, the more you then find um, you feel like, oh, okay, well, I wasn't caught out, but that was just because I spent like all of last night, like reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. And if I hadn't done that, um, I wouldn't have been prepped um, and I would have been caught out. So I need to do even more of that next time. Um, avoidance, this is kind of not talking about it, not admitting to it, um, and um, and kind of also there's a, an element in the literature that says um, we will look at, we'll have kind of mentorship and people who are mentors who are successful in their field, um, and that's been one way of trying to um, deal with the problem. But the issue then is you can set yourself up for feeling like this mentor is amazing, really successful, I can never be like them, and it can actually make it worse. Um, and a desire to be liked, so there was found to be a parallel between imposter syndrome and a desire to be liked and to, to kind of fit in um, with the people around you. And so what you will then do is um, mold, some people will kind of mold their responses or mold what they say or don't say according to who they're with. And then again, you have that feeling of, well, if I'd given my opinion or if I'd not just nodded along to what they were saying, then I would have been out as an imposter. Um, so a lot of people will find, you know, maybe they're at work and there's a discussion about an issue going on. Everyone has a consensus of views. You might feel something different or you might have another idea, another angle on it, but you keep quiet um, because you think, well, that's not a valid viewpoint. Um, and then you go away like thinking, phew, thank God I didn't talk about that um, because then they would have all pointed and laughed at me. Um, so to now <laughs> um, talk about, I want to relate it particularly to cybersecurity um, and why I think it seems quite prevalent in our industry. It's certainly um, a factor kind of throughout professionals um, and there is a lot of literature suggesting and conversations suggesting um, that it impacts the law profession, um, postgraduate students, teachers, um, um, can often feel imposter syndrome. Something I read in the literature around um, the law profession was kind of saying you're expected to be an expert all the time and you turn up and you think, okay, this is going to be the day when everyone looks to me for an answer and I don't have it. And I thought that seemed, that seemed quite relevant to our industry. Um, but the discussion on Twitter and just some of my own thoughts have kind of prompted the next lot of, of what I think are causes that are make it particularly prevalent to cybersecurity. Um, as I said earlier, our industry is very diverse, it's very wide-ranging, um, it has a huge amount of different specialisms in it, um, and that can lead to, um, ironically, insecurity, feelings of insecurity. So you can feel like um, whoever you're talking to, you turn up at a conference presentation, you talk to someone at work, um, wherever you might be, and you think that person knows everything inside out in their field. They have this really deep specialism that you can never even hope to attain. Um, and you suddenly feel like a fraud and you think, okay, they belong here and I really don't. And that can exacerbate it. 
um, what you do at that time is you kind of forget that they are a specialist because they're a specialist and what you do might be completely different. Um, you know, we all need our different specialisms. We're all talking about the need for this industry to be more diverse, um, but we can internalize and kind of forget about that when we're presented with someone who has a real um, deep specialist knowledge. So insecurity, I think, is definitely kind of personal feelings of insecurity um, and feeling intimidated by the knowledge of others um, in a field that is particularly knowledge-based, I think, is um, a contributor. Um, this one is about um, ego. So um, people often comment on um, hackers being egotistical and um, the hacker community being kind of particularly arrogant and, and full of itself. And in, in fact, some people came back to say that um, on my imposter syndrome tweet. And of course, there is a culture of ego um, in cybersecurity and in hacking. Um, and I think that that has a, a twofold effect. One thing can be people present an out, out you know, an external ego um, that seems like they're incredibly full of themselves. And they perhaps do that as a way of masking insecurity. It's quite a well-known fact that sometimes the biggest egos are the most fragile. Um, so I think that's one element of it, but also when you're existing in a culture that is quite ego driven, um, you can feel like everyone else is really smart and is really confident. And that can mean that if you're not so confident and if you do have these um, issues around imposter syndrome, then that can drive it further um, and you can feel even more out of place and even more intimidated. Um, there is also continuing the talk about culture. Um, we tend to have a culture where we um, are quite introverted. Um, we spend a lot of time um, on the internet um, messing around with technology. Um, we are not known for being the most um, social of industries, um, apart from when you're at a conference after party. Um, but in general, we, you know, we have a, a culture of being fairly introverted. Um, and so then that can, again, exacerbate feelings um, of imposter syndrome. The stuff in the literature that kind of says the, the less you talk about it, the less you have a support base, um, the less you communicate and draw support from people, um, then the more you're going to internalize these feelings and the worse that they are going to get. Um, we obviously um, work a lot with technology um, and being someone from a sociological background and who focuses on the human side of cybersecurity, um, I've noticed things in our industry where I've sort of thought, well, that's, you know, we all focus on the binary, you know, we all focus on noughts and um, zeros and ones, um, when in fact, some of the human stuff can often get overlooked. You know, like Holly said in her last talk, solving the phishing problem, solving awareness and behaviors problem is something that this industry has yet to do um, in any way. Um, and I think this then also, so it has an impact on users, it has an impact on the work we're trying to do in organizations, um, but it also, I think, has an impact on our culture and on us as individuals, um, because in a in an industry that's far more comfortable talking about tech than it is about people, um, then it's hard to talk about your emotions. It's hard to um, talk about these feelings of imposter syndrome. And when we don't talk about it, it, it gets worse. We also um, work quite a lot. <laughs> um, we tend to work really long hours. Um, and this is where imposter syndrome for me starts to cross over into burnout, um, issues of stress and burnout, um, and even for some people, depression. Um, so there's, and there's been a few really good articles if you're interested and if you, if you, concerned about this relationship between um, burnout and imposter syndrome. There's some really good um, literature on it um, that basically talks about the more you have imposter syndrome, as I said earlier, the more you drive yourself to learn and to work, the more you push yourself to be better, to know more, to work more, to prove to yourself and to others um, that you are good enough, that you can produce good work, um, that you do have a place in the industry. The more you do that, um, the more you're heading towards burnout. So the constant drive in imposter syndrome to do more, to produce more, to be better, um, can then mean that you don't take care of yourself, you're working too much, you end up stressed and burnt out. 
Um, we also are an industry that by its nature focuses on the flaws in things. Um, we have a culture that, that can be very critical at times, and that's necessary. Um, because that's that's what we're doing in our jobs. We're looking for things that are wrong. Um, we're trying to find flaws, um, and you know we know there's no su such thing as perfection, but we're trying to make everything as good as it can be. And that can cross over then in terms of um, how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about others in the industry and the way that we talk. And for me, this has a relationship um, with the earlier one. Uh, if I go back a couple. Um, in terms of ego. So when we have a, an industry that's quite ego driven um, and that also is very much concerned with flaws and being critical and, and critiquing things, um, it can then combine in like this perfect storm where sometimes we forget um, about the people inside of things and we can be very critical, very quick to point when someone has done something wrong. Um, and for some people that means that they get, they get torn down um, and that obviously can, can have an influence. Um, and in terms of imposter syndrome, somebody came back to say that had happened to them. You know, they'd had some um, strong criticism when they'd made a mistake and then the, from that they'd not had any problems with imposter syndrome and then from that they suddenly felt like they knew nothing, they, it made them question their whole identity. Um, so it can have a personal effect when you face it but also it has an effect in terms of the culture because if we build up a culture that is very critical then people maybe who are new to the field um, or who are trying to develop in the field um, or who are very well established can feel really worried about speaking out, can feel really worried about expressing a different opinion or sharing their work um, because they're worried that they're going to face that same, that same um, teardown. And another issue is around bullying. And, and being critical isn't bullying, um, but sometimes there's, there's different ways of expressing criticism. Um, critique is a, is a really good thing, it's a really positive thing um, to improve. But sometimes how we express criticism um, could be more positive, it could be more constructive. Um, and sometimes criticism can spread over um, into bullying. And this was something, again, it particularly came out of the discussion on Twitter, um, where people said they had been bullied. It was maybe in a job, it was maybe in, in their workplace, or it went back so far as school. Um, but it led them with that feeling of, of not belonging um, and of not ever being good enough. And they saw that as being the, the primary cause of their imposter syndrome. An interesting discussion that came out of this for me was people coming back saying that they didn't feel imposter syndrome, that they never questioned their abilities, um, and that they were perfectly comfortable. Um, and they, some people um, kind of pointed the finger at them a little bit, um, and, and other people kind of said to me, either publicly or privately, like, I don't have an issue with this. Am I a narcissist? Like, is there, should I be doubting myself? Should I be constantly questioning myself? There is a difference between imposter syndrome and being a narcissist. You know, there is a, there is a, a scale, if you know what I mean. Um, if, if you're not, if you don't have imposter syndrome, that doesn't mean you're an arrogant, horrible, narcissistic person. There is, like, a, a balanced level of self-esteem that we can and should all aspire to. Um, so if you don't have this, um, don't worry that that means that there's something wrong with you and that you also need psychotherapy, but for a different reason. Um, and I think this worry actually has an impact. Um, and I think the the Again, it comes back to this egotistical culture of we can look at this culture and we can see how egotistical it is and we can think, I don't want to be like that. Like, I don't want to contribute to that problem. Um, so, and it's not faking imposter syndrome, but because you're so worried about, well, if I'm confident in my abilities, does that make me like a massive idiot and a horrible person and a narcissist? I don't want to be like that. So then you go too far the other way. Um, and it was in one of the pieces of literature about the law profession where the author said um, imposter syndrome comes out of a fear of top gun syndrome. Like you're so worried about being the big massive idiotic ego um, that you retreat and go the other way. Um, and this is like the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, that if you, if you think um, that you are sort of really smart, um, then that must make you really stupid. Um, but there is a nice um, balance. It just can be, 
it can be quite hard to actually believe that you are smart when you're surrounded by stupidity and um, when there's so many examples of people being uh, stupid um, you can kind of think like okay I don't I don't want to be that idiot um, <laughs> And this was a really good thread and somebody on Twitter pointed me towards it and I'm really sorry, I can't remember who pointed me towards it, but it was a really, really good thread that I found really important um, a few weeks ago, about a month ago. Um, and it was somebody in America speaking out saying, I don't have imposter syndrome, like I'm quite confident in what I know and what I don't know. And what I'm struggling with is if I say that, like the room goes quiet, if I say, oh, you know what, I'm quite good at that, um, then everybody like <clears throat> recoils and thinks like, okay, he's the ego, um, we'll all avoid him. Um, and as he says, you can have confidence and not be arrogant. So if you have an issue with imposter syndrome, like you can deal with that and, and try and make yourself um, feel more confident and don't worry that that's going to turn you into um, an idiot. Um, and what Marco says when you go on and read the rest of the thread is he says um, that particularly for him um, confidence is really important. He says that as a black guy if he doesn't or he has experienced in his life that if he doesn't say I'm good at that no one is going to stand up for him and say he's good at that. So he particularly related it to being um, in a minority. And um, I've heard similar said about, about being female, that if you don't push yourself forward, um, no one else is going to. So when you're in a minority, kind of having confidence can be, can be really important. Um, and it shouldn't be seen as something um, that makes you um, arrogant. Um, as I said before about... Um, <laughs> about stupidity. Um, I said my talk was going to be PG. I'm hoping that the B word doesn't like break that rule. Um, but uh, when I said earlier about stupidity, what I was referencing was the tendency in this industry to talk about users being stupid. Um, and I've talked about that a lot. It's one of my bugbears um, because it really doesn't help me when I'm trying to like change behaviors um, and awareness around cybersecurity um, that, that the average person has um, experts in cybersecurity telling them that they're stupid. Um, but because our industry does that a lot, because we like to call people stupid and we like to point the finger, um, I've always looked at that as something that damages users because I think it does and it damages our ability to communicate with them. Um, but also I think it damages us and it's part of that thing of if we're constantly looking for stupidity and pointing out stupidity and pointing the finger at people, um, then that comes back on us because we worry about being the one that is then in the spotlight and the whole community is turning around and looking at them and saying, you're the stupid one. Um, so how, how do you um, deal with it? If you are struggling with imposter syndrome, what can you do to make it better um, and to improve your, your self-esteem? And a lot of this, some of it comes again from the literature, but a lot of this is my personal thoughts and experience, stuff that's worked for me, um, and also things that came out of the discussion on, on Twitter. Um, so this is a very long like academic um, thing from one of the pieces of literature, but it, it comes from the kind of seminal article on imposter syndrome. Um, and what it says, the reason I put it in is because the short version of that is it basically says group therapy really helps. Um, so talking about it in a group is what really helps because people start like sharing their secret, this thing that they've always felt that they have to keep inside and that they can't talk about. Because if you talk about having imposter syndrome, it feels like you're putting a big flag over your head like I did with my opening slide <laughs> saying like I'm the imposter. Um, so if you start to talk about it in a group, you feel like, oh, okay, other people feel this as well um, and you can look at someone next to you so you can the reason I put it in was because this is what seemed to happen on the Twitter discussion um, so it generated a really big discussion and then lots of people came back saying like yeah I've I've always felt like this and I've never talked about it but now I've seen Jack Daniel talking about it or now I've seen Rick Ferguson talking about it now I feel like wow they're amazing they're really well known they suffer from it so you know they're obviously successful and intelligent, so maybe because I suffer from it, from it doesn't mean that I'm stupid, um, and maybe it means that I can talk about it. 
So I'm not saying you necessarily need like group therapy to, to feel better, but definitely talk about it. Create a culture in your workplace where it's okay to talk about it. Find people who feel in a similar way um, and, and try and help to build each other up and just talk about your experiences. Um, <laughs> This, I, I put this in because I just love the phrase, I'm not as green as I am cabbage looking. Um, and it, it kind of relates. Um, so one thing the literature says is try and imagine, if you're feeling really stupid, try and imagine telling this person. So if you feel like um, you've been hired for a job and you're not good enough for that job, try and imagine going to the boss and you fooled your boss, basically. You've made this person hire you because you're so good at um, pretending to be good. You're such a big fraud. Try and imagine going to your boss, who hopefully you respect, and saying, I think you've, like, I've just fooled you into giving me this job. And what your boss would probably say is one of a few things like, do you really think I'm that stupid that you can fool me into thinking that you're right? Do you really think I am as stupid as I look? Um, and they might also say, you know, like, why, why would you, why would I be fooled? Do you not think I've got the experience and the knowledge to know when someone is good at something and when they're just taking the mick? Um, another thing people said, particularly on Twitter, is surround yourself with positive people. Um, so try and try and work with people, try and talk to people, try and engage with people who take a more positive outlook on life. Um, don't let that make you feel like you can't talk about negative stuff. So just because you're with positive people, I think the danger with this could be that you could then feel like you don't want to be the negative one. Um, whereas it's, it's not about that, um, but it's about trying to have a support network and that thing about being with radiators, not drains. Um, so people that give you energy, give you support, rather than take it from you. And this one... <laughs> This one's quite close to my heart because um, I really procrastinated about this talk. <laughs> oh, the irony. Um, so procrastination, in my experience, is really, 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 really bad for imposter syndrome. Um, and it almost directly comes out of it. So you can... It, you can feel like you don't want to confront your own stupidity by working on something. So you just find ways of avoiding it. Procrastination is the worst thing you can do because it just makes you feel bad. It places more stress and pressure on you. So in terms of burnout, it's really bad. Um, so it's better in terms of imposter syndrome just to get on um, and do it because it has to be done. Uh, and the more you produce, the more you do, although you don't want to burn out, the more you do, um, and the more you see tangible results of your work, the better imposter syndrome can be. But I'm going to contradict myself by saying you also need to take breaks. So not procrastinating and trying to produce and trying to, trying to produce work um, and content is not saying work all the time. So that's another really big danger with imposter syndrome, as I said earlier, in terms of burnout. Um, and I apologize for how cheesy some of these are. But... At the same time, we all take breaks in different ways. Um, and for different people, relaxing means a totally different thing. For some people, it's like going to yoga, whereas for other people, it's like playing GTA. So whatever it is that means, <laughs> and for some people, it's both. Um, but, you know, whatever it is, going for pedicures and manicures, um, you know, whatever it might be, like just chill out sometimes, um, but schedule it. Like, don't have a day where you get up and you use, like, relaxing as procrastination. Instead, decide, okay, I'm going to get X, Y, Z done, and then I am going to go and go for a walk, or I'm going to give my cat tummy tickles, or whatever it might be, um, as if you can schedule tummy tickles with a cat. Um, like, they just don't relate to a diary. Um, but anyway, so take a break. Um... <laughs> This one is about um, sometimes you've kind of got to fake it till you make it. And I'm not talking about faking skills at all. That will not help um, with imposter syndrome. What I'm talking about is faking confidence. Um, a lot of people think that your emotions drive your behaviors, whereas actually behaviors can drive emotions. Even so, such a simple thing as like how you stand, whether you stand with like good posture, sorry, whether you stand with good posture or whether you like slump over can really affect how you feel internally. So if it's about self-esteem and if it's about confidence, sometimes it is literally about 
kind of working out like how can you give off a positive confident image and then you find after time and I can tell you from experience that that just kind of becomes internalized and at some point the confident image that you've been projecting to some extent becomes part of who you are putting on lip gloss is not obligatory um I mean I might personally recommend it but you know don't feel like you have to do that the most important thing is like like sometimes fake it till you make it with confidence this one is a key one for me um it's it's actually for me like the top tip which is everyone has or I personally have like loads of to-do lists I have a wall of to-do lists like literally um and that really keeps me on track and I couldn't like do anything without that um and as important as that is, is having a done list. And I usually keep this online if my website like hadn't broken. Um, but I usually keep online a done list and it will be like projects I've completed, events I've spoken at, um, articles I've done, whatever it might be. And whether you want it to be public or private, keeping track of things that you've done and reflecting on where you have had achievements and where you've um, done things that you're proud of is for me probably the biggest one because sometimes we can keep driving ourselves to the next and the next and the next thing that we need to do. This constant pressure we put on ourselves to produce more and to do more work. Um, whereas in fact, sometimes it's good to take stock and to say, oh, actually I did that thing, which I completely forgot about. And that was really cool. And I'm like quite happy with that. Um, this is another one that is for me, um, at the start, you, you know, I did that like silly intro of like, oh, when I'm not working, I do this, that, and the other. Um, I've, I've had lots of hobbies for a while. Um, and I, that comes out of when I did my PhD. Um, when I did my PhD, I also felt like a fish out of water because <laughs> although I'm a sociologist, I was in um, the Department of Civic Design, which is engineering, um, which is not really a place for sociologists. So I was in there doing a PhD and I felt um, a bit out of my depth um, and had some issues around imposter syndrome. And one thing I found really important was having random hobbies. Um, so I did like ballroom dancing lessons and singing lessons, um, which didn't really pay off. Um, <laughs> but doing anything um, that pushes you out of your comfort zone. So stuff that is not related to work, um, that is fun, but that also pushes you. That's why I did the trapeze thing um, recently just stuff to kind of build up your self-esteem and make you feel better you know some of it may be connected to work but one of my biggest pieces of advice is to make it also not connected to work and um, so that your whole identity and self-esteem isn't tied up in um, your day job um this slide with the, the buses is about the Helsinki bus um, theory. I don't know if anyone has heard of this, um, but this is particularly orientated at people who are at the near the start of their career or who are more junior um, and who might be feeling like everything they know people have already learned. And so, you know, what's the point of them learning stuff and talking about stuff because everyone that they're talking to has already been there and done that and, you know, literally got the T-shirt. Um, the Helsinki bus theory, I read about it in relation to photographers. Um, in Helsinki, when you get a bus out of the city centre, you they all take the same route for ages. Um, and they all stop at the same stop. And you can feel like, you know, are you going to the right destination? Because they all go in the same direction. So you might be tempted at one point to get off and to go back to the start and to try and like find the, the right bus. Is this the right bus for me? I don't know if this is going where I need to go. Um, and it is a parallel with your career where we all go through a stage of learning where we're learning stuff that people have learned before and we feel like we are never going to find our niche we're never going to find our own approach our own place um, in the industry whereas you kind of have to go through that you have to go through all the same Helsinki stops that other people have gone to and then suddenly you'll find that your journey starts to go off in a different direction so it is totally normal if you're new-ish, if you're junior in the industry, or if you're just starting to learn about something that you haven't learned about before, it's entirely normal to feel um, like you're an imposter. There's nothing wrong with that. We've all been there. We've all felt like that. That's part and parcel of um, being in the industry and learning something new, being junior. What you have to do is just stay on the bus. Um, you just have to keep going and going and going and have faith. Um, 
this ties into the thing of like sometimes how you project the things that you, um, the way you behave or the things that you say um, can influence how you actually feel internally. Um, people with imposter syndrome, there is an argument that um, they will tend to be more apologetic and they will apologize so much it's like they're apologizing for their existence. Um, and there's a way of kind of reframing that. So instead of always saying, sorry, sorry for taking up so much time, um, sorry I was late, um, sorry that I'm boring you, sorry that I still have to learn this, instead it's about saying thank you. So thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you for helping me learn this. Thank you for having patience while I was late. And that has this internal effect where instead of constantly apologizing and constantly basically saying sorry that I'm here, um, Instead, you're, you're kind of saying, I'm grateful, and this is positive, and I'm taking something from you, and, and using it in a constructive way. Um, and a key thing, really, is um, looking after yourself. And as I said earlier, that differs for everybody. Um, you know, there are things that are proven to be true, particularly if imposter syndrome is tying into burnout and depression. Um, then exercise, you know, the boring stuff like exercise, which can just be like going for a walk. It doesn't have to be like going to the gym and like throwing kettlebells around. Um, and eating healthily, eating well, sleeping, like making sure you don't work like 9 to 5 a.m. Um, and actually just finding ways to look after yourself um, will build up your self-esteem and help you um, be more resilient against this feeling of, of being a fraud. I said it was PG um, when I submitted it, so I thought I should I thought I should not let Robin down. And as I think they put that thing in of like how rude is your talk, I think I put that in because of the keynote last year with Freaky Clown when he swore like every other word. So I thought I probably should like be good um, but there is like a form now of theory that is a, a form of therapy that is based around this of like just saying feck it um, <laughs> and sometimes you have to do that it's like what is the worst that can happen okay the worst that can happen is if you know nothing and you are found out you may lose your job but like you'll you'll get another job like literally trace it down to okay I'm getting up today and I'm doing a talk about imposter syndrome and I what's the worst that can happen before I get up okay I might get up and I might forget absolutely everything that I'm going to say well at b-sides I got up and presented a slide and I could not remember at all what to say on it so I just skipped to the next slide like life goes on I'm still here so what's the worst that can come out of a situation if you're really stressed about it think about that and try and get it in perspective and then at the end of the day just you know yeah I want to thank you all um, for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I would love to take them. Um, but most of all, I want to say thank you for everyone that retweeted um, the poll on Twitter, for everyone who um, voted in it, for everyone who commented in it. Um, because if you hadn't done that, um, there wouldn't have been the blog post, there wouldn't have been the discussion, um, there wouldn't have been this presentation today. And a few people have said how much it's helped them to talk about it. So if you guys hadn't done that, we wouldn't have talked about it and those people that it helped wouldn't have, have been helped. Um, so I really do mean it. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you did that. I'm really grateful for your attention today. Um, there is a little bit of time now for questions. Um, so if we've got any questions now, I'm, we've got about five minutes to take them. Um, or you can find me via all the social media um, type ways or I'm around all day doing the quiz and the scavenger hunt tonight. Quick um, little plug for that. Um, so feel free to come and chat. Thanks. There is a few minutes before I'm going to hand over to the next speaker so they can set up. If anyone's got a question now, wave your hand. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Um, so the question was whether you can yo-yo in and out of imposter syndrome and have some jobs where you feel like cool and fine and comfortable and other jobs where you um, don't um, and you feel like terrible about yourself. Or um, And I definitely think that's true. And, and people said that to me. Um, 
I mean, there's something around imposter syndrome. Some people kind of say like it's putting a label on something that, that shouldn't be labeled. It's part of just being human to doubt yourself. And I do think to some extent that's true. Um, so to some extent, it's normal to have a job or a project where you're in your comfort zone and it goes fine. And then maybe you have a project where you're out of your comfort zone and you feel like, ah. Um, and that's, that's kind of normal. And that goes back to the staying on the bus thing. Um, but also, I think it does fluctuate, and it, it might not even be about the project, you know? So you might be working on a project that has paralleled with stuff you've done before, where you, actually you do have the experience and the knowledge, but maybe because of other stuff in your life, maybe the environment, the people you're working with, or maybe just going back to some of that stuff about stress and burnout and, and sort of not taking care of yourself or not having the chance to take care of yourself. So other things can definitely impact it. Um, and for some people, it comes completely out of the blue. So like the guy I said that was totally fine and confident until something went wrong. And then ever since then, he's, he's struggled with it, even though nothing's gone, gone wrong again. So it can sometimes just completely come and, and knock you from the side, I think, as well. Quick one more. Stuart was first, and then I have to hand over to the other speaker. Congrats. You, don't, you do not look it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the question was, um, so I congratulated him on his, on his young age. Um, but the question was, um, you know, is it if you've, a lot of us have fallen into the industry. I know I did myself. A lot of other people have. Um, if you haven't got the kind of qualifications and stuff, are you more likely to feel imposter syndrome than like the kids coming up now who will have like more formally studied the, the, the industry and the subject? Um, I do think falling into it probably makes is one factor, but I don't think it's like one thing that causes it. I think that, that's why I tried to sort of go through the list because I think loads of things can cause it and you can tick every box of every qualification and have all the experience and actually that can make it worse. Like I, I sort of said earlier, um, because that can make you feel like you've got everything, like you've done everything that you should have. So people expect more of you um, than if you've kind of fallen into the industry and found your way. And then, you know, maybe like you can you can get away with stuff a little bit more. I think it's um, I think it's all down to kind of all those other factors, more like the cultural factors and maybe some of the personality factors, um, because we can all kind of find a reason as to, to what me makes us an imposter. And it can either be, I've got no background in this, so I'm an imposter, or I've got a massive, really like deep background in this and I still know nothing, so that makes me an imposter. So it can be kind of two sides. Um, we've got time for one more question. There were a couple of hands that went up. Ah, yes. Yep. When you're doing your research, you find that the NHS or the wider medical community are now recognising that the mental health issue wasn't just someone's personality. Yeah, so the question was, um, when I said earlier that it was sort of seen as a personality trait, is it being recognized more now um, by the medical profession, for example, as a mental health issue? I think it's more being recognized as linked to mental health, um, so kind of linked to anxiety, I think, in particular, um, but also to depression, um, and as I said earlier, to kind of to burnout and exhaustion. So it seems to be re being recognized more and more in that way. Um, and I think that, for me, is the, the key thing, is when it ties in with other stuff, it can be exacerbated and it can also exacerbate those things. Um, I'm very conscious of time and letting the next speaker set up. So if there are any other questions, come find me and we'll chat. And thank you again.